Somehow, Nanotyrannus has returned. Over the past 40-ish years, a skull at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History has been the subject of a taxonomic controversy. That's because in 1988, Bakker et al. named it as Nanotyrannus, the little tyrant. And actually, even earlier, it was named as Gorgosaurus lancensis, a new species of Gorgosaurus, as it is pretty similar in stature to some fossils of Gorgosaurus, and has slightly longer than deep snout of adult Tyrannosaurus, also from the same formation. You can see that in this figure here, where Tyrannosaurus very clearly has a very tall skull, and that would have helped it to power very strong jaws. That said, this kind of skull deepening has been said to be something that could happen over ontogeny, basically just the bones changing as the animals grew. And because of that, some have argued that Nanotyrannus is actually just a juvenile of the large Tyrannosaur that it would have lived alongside, again, Tyrannosaurus rex. Over the last 40 years, and in light of the dinosaur renaissance, a lot more small Hell Creek and Lance Formation Tyrannosaurs have been found, like the Jane specimen at the Burpee Museum. Jane in particular is interesting, as the skull of the Cleveland specimen and Jane are pretty similar, meaning most likely they are very closely related. And their skulls are seemingly different from the baby Bob specimen, which is a juvenile Tyrannosaur, and based on the height of the skull bones that have been found, was almost certainly Tyrannosaurus rex. But as you can see, Baby Bob is very partial. It's an awful fossil and almost certainly young. And that's because some bone histology suggests that it was only about four years of age. And that's basically been the debate. Are things like the Cleveland specimen and the Jane specimen different enough to be a totally distinct genus from Tyrannosaurus, that one being Nanotyrannus, or are they just young individuals of Tyrannosaurus? And that would mean Tyrannosaurus underwent massive ontogenetic change, but dinosaurs are weird. That includes T-Rex. What's been needed to solve this debate was a more complete, unambiguously adult, small to medium-sized Tyrannosaur, with completely unique etapomorphies, which is to say, traits that are entirely distinct to it and not to any other Tyrannosaur, not even Tyrannosaurus rex. Enter the North Carolina Museum of Natural History and their donors, who allowed for the purchase of the dueling dinosaur's Bloody Mary specimen, which contains a moderately sized Tyrannosaur and a Triceratops, which were buried together. And such a complete fossil means more opportunities for analysis. By using this fossil over 200 other Tyrannosaur fossils, growth models for different specimens, and newly identified phylogenetic characters, Lindsay Zano and James Napoli were able to examine if Nanotyrannus did actually exist, or if they are just all young Tyrannosaurus. One of the most clear traits that separates these two animals is this recess on the quadratojugal of Nanotyrannus, something which Tyrannosaurus rex doesn't have. One of the authors, Dr. James Napoli, did his entire PhD showing that these kinds of features are static. They don't change as an animal ages. So that's pretty good evidence that this is clearly not a young Tyrannosaurus, but instead that Nanotyrannus is valid. And if you think that's really big news, then you'll be shocked at how out of hand this is getting, as now there are two of them. That's right, looking at many of the small Tyrannosaur fossils from North America, there are two species of Nanotyrannus. One is Nanotyrannus lancensis, the one that we've already talked about, but the other is Nanotyrannus lathaeus, with lathaeus being based off of the Jane specimen on the basis of its larger size, even larger than the 20-year-old Bloody Mary specimen, but at an even younger age at only around 11. There's also a number of other traits like the shape of the maxillary fenestra, this process on the palatine bone, and a number of other things. This image shows the size of Jane, BMRP 2002.4.1 when compared to the Bloody Mary specimen. And you can see it is definitely larger. As for the differences from Tyrannosaurus, the Bloody Mary specimen is again unequivocally an adult, and that's based on bone histology, meaning you cut open the bones and count the lags, lines of arrested growth. These are lines which show up when the animal slowed its growth during less productive seasons, which tend to be pretty much annual. This shows that the Bloody Mary specimen died at about 20, and the Jane specimen, which was larger and still different than Tyrannosaurus rex, died at about 11. And this shows that Nanotyrannus is valid, which is a massive change to our recent understanding of paleo-ecosystems at the end of the Cretaceous. This is because the most prevailing idea has been that Tyrannosaurus basically just outcompeted all of the moderately sized competitors. Basically that as they grew, the juvenile Tyrannosaurs were so successful and needed so much food for their prey that it became difficult for other predators that were moderately sized to survive. So this confirmation basically that Nanotyrannus is valid 
does help to show that Tyrannosaurus did live alongside other moderately sized predators. And that's despite Nanotyrannus being from an even earlier group of Tyrannosaurs. Whereas the Tyrannosaurus line developed massive heads and small arms, Nanotyrannus had a moderately sized head, but had arms which were overall more useful than those in other Tyrannosaurs, with some parts of the hand that are actually larger than the same parts in any known Tyrannosaur, even ones like Tyrannosaurus, which are many, many times as massive across the rest of the body. In fact, the hands of Nanotyrannus still have a little bit of the third finger, as opposed to just very obviously being two-fingered like in Tyrannosaurus. That's not to say it didn't see a reduction in its hands, though. In fact, Nanotyrannus plots phylogenetically near the first point where arm reduction occurred in Eutyrannosauria, which you can see here on this phylogeny. What that might mean is that something called pedamorphosis occurred in the group, basically keeping juvenile traits into adulthood. In this hypothesis, the common ancestor of late Cretaceous tyrannosaurs experienced an arm reduction during adulthood. But in adult Nanotyrannus and the lineage that led to it, this was basically reversed, keeping the relatively longer arms of the juveniles all the way into adulthood. This occurring potentially in isolation, while other tyrannosaurs continued down the path of skull enlargement and arm reduction. Alternatively, the large tyrannosaur groups like the Albertosaurians and the Tyrannosaurians may have just developed similar strategies of head enlargement and arm reduction in tandem, and that path just simply wasn't selected for due to the evolutionary pressures that were facing the lineage that led to Nanotyrannus. There's a number of other traits that show it's different as well, like having more teeth, which has been in contention. It was thought that potentially as the teeth became larger and the animal grew, that Tyrannosaurus just lost some of the teeth, but that doesn't track. This adult animal has between 15 and 17 teeth on just one side of its jaws, but Tyrannosaurus never has more than 12. So for Nanotyrannus and Tyrannosaurus to be the same species, it means that Tyrannosaurus would have needed to undergo massive changes that are seen in no other Tyrannosaur or even any other Archosaurs. In fact, we have fossils of juvenile Tarbosaurus and juvenile Gorgosaurus, and all have basically the same tooth counts as adults, with maybe just a little bit of variation. But heck, even as a human, I vary. I only had three wisdom teeth. So a little bit of variation in an entire population isn't strange, but it should really only be one or two, not going from 12 all the way up to 17. These changes seem to be because of a very unique evolutionary history. While the Tyrannosaurus lineage came to North America during the very latest Cretaceous, I was even on a paper that talked about that, the phylogeny estimates that Nanotyrannus split off from the other Tyrannosaurs around 103 million years ago which is right around the time that the Western Interior Seaway split North America into Laramidia in the West and Appalachia in the East. And unfortunately, Appalachian dinosaurs are very, very rare. However, Dryptosaurus has been found in New Jersey, is a Tyrannosaur, and it wasn't small-armed. Towards the end of the Cretaceous, the Western Interior Seaway would shrink into a large embayment in Canada and parts of the northern U.S. And there is a real possibility that Nanotyrannus is the blast of the Appalachian Tyrannosaurs. In fact, the Nanotyrannus specimens plot next to both Appalachiosaurus and Dryptosaurus, the eastern Tyrannosaurs, and these authors group them in Nanotyrannidae. Unfortunately, both of these are very partial, so there needs to be a lot better work to establish if that is the case, or also if the family should be called Dryptosauridae, since Dryptosaurus was named first, but that's not here or there. Again, it needs more testing, and even these authors admit it because not all of their tests show the same pattern. Regardless, the idea of an entirely or at least mostly hidden lineage of tyrannosaurs surviving on the eastern part of the continent that was exposed during the Cretaceous is really intriguing. It really wants you to beg the question of what was going on there? Why is it so unfortunate that we don't have good rocks from that time period in the eastern part of the US? There's a lot of questions that could be answered from them, and unfortunately, there's just not a lot of fossils coming from those regions. And that's kind of the case with all of Tyrannosauroidea. A lot of that phylogeny has been really, really difficult to understand. And this might just be one of the first steps towards addressing those questions of where the Tyrannosaurs and different parts of the Tyrannosaur family tree really originate. As for the actual size of these animals, the Bloody Mary specimen was, again, adult or nearly adult. Its growth had slowed. And the estimates place it at about 700 kilograms, or 1,500 pounds, as opposed to the estimates of around 7,500 kilograms, or 16,500 pounds for an adult Tyrannosaurus. Jane, again, was still growing, meaning that if the growth patterns held like they do with other Tyrannosaurs, 
it would have still been in the accelerated growth phase and could have reached as much as 1,200 kilograms or 2,600 pounds. Now, as for why this is important, you really need to look at a lot of other studies. And I'm gonna use this example from Schroeder et al. 2021, where there's this wonderful figure that compares the landscape of the late Cretaceous of North America to what's happening in modern day Africa. And what you see is there's a whole lot of mesopredators, that is predators smaller than lions that are still occupying a lot of ecospace. Now, the Hell Creek definitely didn't have quite as dramatic as shown here, as we now know, with two Nanotariana species filling in that gap. But there's still a lot of diversity relative to modern day ecosystems that's missing. So there's still something pretty strange going on with this ecosystem, but it is more complex than simply T-Rex outcompeted everything. And that was the idea for a long time, using these Nanotyrannus specimens as juvenile T-Rex specimens. Basically that Tyrannosaurus, when it was small, sure, some of them would have died because they were that small, but as they reached their moderate sizes, they simply outcompeted all of the other moderately sized predators. That's simply just not the case. And in fact, there's art that goes with this where you actually see a number of Nanotyrannus trying to hunt a juvenile T-Rex, which is just a really fun way to think about it. Honestly, it kind of brings me back to Jurassic Fight Club which accuracy aside, which it is missing some, was still at least a fun idea. <laughs> now, of course, this is going to leave other questions like how did this actually affect the ecosystem? Having another large predator is a pretty big change. And other than Bob, where are the actual juvenile Tyrannosaurus? Especially since Bob is so partial and a privately held specimen, so it's really hard to actually study and access. It's hard to know for sure. There's other fossil animals as well that we might just be missing details on. Maybe there is other fossils that are totally new species that are just laying in plain sight and we haven't realized. I have a feeling James Napoli has some strong feelings about that based on a lot of his PhD. And then there's also other drama. There's an editor's note on this that we are providing an unedited version of this manuscript to give early access to its findings. Before final publication, the manuscript will undergo further editing. Please note, there may be errors present which affect the content and all legal disclaimers apply. Basically, someone messed up and let all of this become accessible early. And in order to protect the authors so they don't get scooped like Dr. Melanie During did, the journal released this early. And for the During situation, you can check my video on that for a real good explanation of kind of what's happened there. After that, the New York Times released their article about this paper early. And then Nature released their own press about it early. And then the paper came out. And it was at least supposed to come out after the Society of Herbert Paleontology meeting in a few weeks, where both of these authors were supposed to present part of the research. So yeah, the media just kind of messed up and released a bunch of stuff early, which forced the journal's hand where they also had to put this out early so no one steals the work that Dr. Zano and Dr. Napoli have done. Which, again, it's just really unfortunate considering how important of a paper this is that it's getting leaked early.